Hey guys, I am live for our monthly Q&A. So I know it's been a while since I've gone live and fully nourished. Um, I apologize about that. Um, it's just kind of like the holidays came. I was in a funk around Christmas time and I haven't gotten back into it. But um, going forward, we're going to do them on the first Monday of every single month. So Fully Nourished Lives will be the first Monday of every month, just so we can keep it easy and keep it simple. I know that some of you are on the other side of the planet, and so I may change up the time. Um, it might be in the mornings or in the evenings, depending. So um, that will kind of uh, be announced once I, de once I decide. It is easier for me to go live in the afternoon, but I know that some of you can only be live in the morning, so... Um, we'll kind of figure that out. But yeah, first Monday of every month. Um, so yeah, just throw your questions at me. If you guys have any questions, please ask. Um, this is going to be a great way for me to get to your questions because as of now, the Facebook group has kind of grown to the point where um, I can no longer keep up with the questions. And so um, I do want to offer an outlet where you guys can get your questions answered by me. Um, I know there are some questions that are just kind of out of the realm of um, something that I can help you with. Um, some of you do need one-on-one uh, -on -one support. And so it's kind of one of those things where I'm working towards um, giving, giving you guys options for one-on-one -on -one support as well. So um, yeah, uh, I hope you guys are doing well. I hope Fully Nourished is going well. Um, I know the principles are kind of a lifelong thing. It's not like, you know, a beginning and an end. <laughs> there's no, um, there's no, I made it type of thing, but, um, I hope you guys are all doing better and seeing improvements. Um, thoughts on oils like Young Living. I really like essential oils. I think essential oils are, um, you know, a great alternative to, to, you know, just relying on certain medications. Um, you know, for example, when I have a headache, I'll try peppermint oil before I'll just reach for the Advil. With that being said, I think there are people out there that use them a little bit irresponsibly, you know, like rubbing them directly on your thyroid or things like that can pose some problems because of the phenols. But overall, essential oils can be a really great addition, especially if they're really pure. Um, I don't think the MLM companies are necessary. I uh, apologize if this offends people that are part of doTERRA or Young Living, um, but I don't think you need to be buying those oils. Um, Plant Therapy is a really great brand, uh, very inexpensive, very pure. Uh, Mountain Rose Herb herbs offers a lot of pure essential oils. So there are a lot of options other than Young Living or doTERRA, which in my opinion are actually quite overpriced. They'll say that they're more pure than others on the market, but they're not. They're just overpriced. So um, I do think they're great, uh, especially for like if you want to, you know, scent things or take a nice smelling bath or um, maybe scent your own beeswax candles or things like that. They can be really therapeutic. With Fully Nourished, there are so many great things to incorporate. What should the priority be for order of implementation? Um, so I kind of designed the modules to be exactly, how, like laid out exactly how you should be implementing things over time. So obviously you're not gonna stress about red light therapy when you haven't even gotten your food frequency down. But I think the most important things we should be focusing on in Fully Nourished are making sure we are getting enough nourishment. So eating at least three solid meals a day first if we don't already do that. If we already do three solid meals, then maybe experimenting with like a mid-afternoon snack, a bedtime snack, getting our food frequency down and seeing how often we have to be eating. And then we also want to make sure we're really aiming to create balance and make sure we're getting a protein, carb, and fat at every single meal. So some people um, do really well with a one to two protein carb ratio and some people do fine with a one to one protein carb ratio. So it just depends on the person. But um, you know, some people do need to figure out like what, what they need carbohydrate wise. Protein is very important. So making sure you're getting 80 to 100 grams a day 
is going to really make a different in, difference in your day-to-day life. But yeah, overall, I would say nutrition is the first thing. So making sure you're getting enough, making sure you're getting the right things. You're not relying too heavily on things like nuts and seeds or things that are talked about and fully nourished. And then making sure that you have gotten your food frequency down. Um, those are going to be the, the ultimate priority. Everything else is kind of just condiments to those principles um, in the nourishment module. Um, When it comes to manually balancing blood sugar, if we don't have something balanced on hand, is it better to eat what we have on hand than not eat at all? (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I always aim to have something balanced on hand. For example, um, you can find at most health food stores, Trader Joe's, will have like these little fruit um, leathers, kind of like fruit, you know, just dried fruit in a leather or dried fruit period. You can get that at Costco or um, any any store usually has some type of dried fruit. So that, that would be your carbohydrate. And then I always do like beef jerky or beef jerky bars. Those are things that can always stay in your purse or always stay in your glove box. They don't go bad. And so those are things that I always have on hand because that therefore is balanced. Um, and you can totally like cut the beef jerky up and make a like almost trail mix like thing as well. Like I'll throw a few chocolate chips in there as well. Like cut up beef jerky, um, chocolate chips and some dried fruit, which is a really nice snack. But if you don't have something balanced, absolutely opt for that. But, you know, also prepare and keep that the balanced meal mindset is in fact something that should always kind of be at the back of our mind and how we plan food, how we prepare food, how we bring food. You know, if we're going for a snack, we should always keep that in the back of our mind. But if we find ourselves in a situation where we don't have access to something balanced, then of course we we should be eating. Um, sometimes what I'll do, like if I'm in a pinch, you can always find something. So for example, like if I'm out or, um, you know, I'm stuck somewhere, uh, like for example, two weeks ago, I was out. I didn't have access to much, but I could go to In-N-Out Burger. And so what I did was I got a, um, what they call Flying Dutchman, which is just two patties and two pieces of cheese. And then I got a lemonade. Why did I do that? It's probably not the most optimal food, but I wasn't just going to eat a bunch of protein without any carbohydrate. I knew I would feel like trash within an hour and I was going to be out for the next four hours. So I, I needed to choose. I needed to to decide would I rather be out and about on running on just protein or with nothing at all or include a lemonade which probably not the best source of carbs but delicious a a source of carbohydrates nonetheless and balanced with protein and fat and that's what I chose so you know just keep those things in mind you know it's very important to kind of like figure out where you are hormonally, you might be in a place where your context is, I am going to include, you know, a small cup of lemonade or something with a burger so that I don't feel a blood sugar crash an hour later and start to feel like absolute crap. Hey Jess, do you think it's ever beneficial to do cardio regularly or should we just stick to strength training? I think cardio can be beneficial when done right and really depending on like your own health. If you do fine with with some like hit intervals or things like that in your training, I don't see a problem with it at all. You know, plyometrics can be as hard or as soft as you want them to be, right? So um, jumping like jump squats and jumping lunges and, you know, plyo leaps and things like that. I actually really like plyometrics when hormones are um, pretty stable and you have a lot of stability hormone hormonally. Um, it's a great way to build bone density. It's a great way to, um, get your heart rate up. It's a great way to lose fat and, uh, yeah, it it can totally be, um, a a good addition. Something else uh, is you could do like 10 to you know, 15 minutes of a warm up, like a moderate cardio warm up to your strength training. That also works really well. So yeah, cardio can definitely be a part of, a a healthy routine it just depends on the type like if someone was going to say like hey I'm going to run a marathon I'd probably be like okay like you can totally do it and a lot of people can make it happen hormonally but do you want to be pushing your body to the limits every day do you want that responsibility of having to fuel yourself for that Mm, probably not um, unless you really love running a marathon but like adding some HIIT training adding some plyometrics jump you know, jumping, jumping with weights, um, kettlebell stuff like kettlebell swings can be definitely beneficial. 
and it's a great way to lose lose weight. Um, people that have eaten a, fu a fully nourished style of eating for a while, and I know a lot of you have done it since July, you're probably pretty hormonally stable if you feel like you are. And if your temps and pulses uh, react pretty well to your training, then yeah, try some more cardio. Is counting macros going to be necessary for weight loss or can it be done intuitively? Um, I think it can be done intuitively if you're willing to understand macros. I, I think that there are people that cannot lose weight intuitively because they just don't understand. For example, when they're eating fat, they just don't comprehend how many calories they're eating. For example, they when they go to cook their eggs, they cut a two tablespoon serving of butter, which is 300 calories. And every single day they do the same thing over and over again, and they don't understand why they're not losing weight. And so if you counted your macros for like a week, you'd realize like, oh my gosh, I'm eating 30 grams of fat from that little t two tablespoons of butter. If I just turn that into a teaspoon, I could maybe lose some weight. And so I do think it's possible to intuitively lose weight, especially if you're um, practicing a lot of things that are maybe contributing to weight gain, like things that are gonna be inflammatory, eating tons of nuts and seeds, um, maybe not balancing your meals and stress is high, then absolutely you can intuitively lose weight. Sometimes I find that my clients or other fully nourished students, just by implementing food frequency and making sure they're getting enough protein um, and getting carbs from the right sources, they absolutely lose weight. But then there's some people, for example, let's just use someone that's coming from a low carb or a key keto style of eating, they uh, are very used to and have a habit of getting 60% of their calories from fats. And so they're actually looking for ways to add fats to their diet. And so when they come into a fully nourished style of eating, they're still in that mindset of adding fat to their food constantly, so much fat. And then on top of it, they're adding carbohydrates as well. Fat's not bad, but fat's very calorie dense. And so here we have an excessive amount of calories from fat coming into the diet, and the body's really confused as to what it should use for fuel. It wants to use carbs, but there's so much fat available, and so there's where you kind of have this inefficient burning of glucose taking place. So yes, you can, short answer to that question is you can absolutely lose weight intuitively, but there are some people that cannot, and when you start to really hit that wall, sometimes counting macros can be really helpful. And I always look at it, you know, a lot of people will say like, oh, macros are so hard to count. It's like such a big deal. It really doesn't have to be. Honestly, it can be so easy and so quick once you get used to it. For example, I should have brought my food scale up, but I know a food scale can sound intimidating or like, oh gosh, that's very obsessive, but it really depends. You know, if you would feel better and more comfortable in your body and your health would be better by losing some weight, sometimes just counting macros for even just a week can be super enlightening. But you literally have your food scale on your counter. So let's pretend this notepad is your food scale and you're going to put your dish on it. So let's say you have a plate and you're gonna set it to zero. And then you're literally, when you serve your food, so you're gonna put food on your plate regardless, you're gonna put protein on your plate, you're gonna put carbs on your plate anyways, just have your plate on a food scale and, and have it um, balanced out or zeroed out. So all you have to do is scoop your protein onto your plate like you normally would, but now you just know how much you're eating. So you know, oh, I'm getting four ounces of protein right now, awesome. Or six ounces of protein right now, awesome. And then you can go into My Fitness Pal and be like, oh yeah, six ounces of chicken is this, me you know, this many grams of protein. And then you zero it out again. And then you add your carbs to your plate. Carbs, carbs, oh my gosh, that's four ounces of carbs? Whoa, I had no idea what four ounces of carbs look like. And then you go over to My Fitness Pal and put four ounces of sweet potato. And you're like, whoa, I had no idea. And so it's just very enlightening. Um, and especially the fats, like the fats can be really enlightening, especially if you, you come from like a low carb or a keto past. So macros do, does not have to be complicated. Personally, I recommend doing your macros the night before. If you're gonna count macros, you kind of have, have an idea of what you're gonna eat, what you have in the fridge. Um, usually what I'll do is I'll kind of come out with it, up with a game plan. I eat very similar things for breakfast every day, so I'm gonna just enter my normal breakfast, enter my normal snacks, and I'm gonna do it the night before. And then if I, if throughout that day I eat something different or I decide to maybe switch out a meal, I can quickly do that 
that night. I don't have to even mess with my macros throughout the day at all. I literally just do it in the evenings for five minutes before I go to bed if I'm counting macros. And I don't always count them. I don't think you always have to count them unless you have a goal and you're having a hard time reaching that goal and you need reasons or answers as to why you're having a hard time with that goal. I've heard you talk about going low fat, high protein, and carb ideally for weight loss. Is fat less important when it comes to having balanced meals and snacks? Does this mean fat can sometimes be omitted? Um, the reason why I talk about going lower fat is because we don't need to add a ton of fat to our meals. Uh, oftentimes, for example, when we're eating eggs, eggs have fat in the yolks. We're gonna usually add some type of fat to the pan to cook our eggs in. And there, we probably have 10 or 15 grams of fat right there. And then, you know, sometimes we'll add some Parmesan cheese, so there's more fat. And so there's no need to like go out of my way to add an avocado. There's already fat in that meal. Or for example, we will eat chicken thighs with dinner and we marinate those in like some olive oil or some type of um, oil with you know vinegar and other spices. There you go, you have chicken thighs which already have fat in them and then on top of it, we're marinating them in an oil and probably cooking our potatoes in some type of fat as well. We don't need to go and add fat to that meal. So oftentimes there's going to be naturally occurring fats or fats that we're cooking with in a meal and we don't have to go out of our way to add fat. Um, I do think it's a good idea to add some fat to meals. Um, uh, if, if there's fat not already present in something, for example, like I will make a protein shake, um, usually for a snack, and the milk base that I use is whole milk. So I know, okay, there's fat in there. I don't need to add like MCT oil or coconut oil or something like that. There's already fat in my milk, and so I don't need to go out of my way to add fat. Um, but yes, uh, fats are going to be more calorie dense, and they're not going to provide as much energy as carbohydrates. Protein should pretty much stay moderate you know, 100-ish grams, depending on your activity level and your size. If you're bodybuilding or strength training, you probably need a little more. If you're maybe a small person and you're not that active, then you maybe need a little less. It, it, it depends. Um, and then for carbohydrates, they're always going to provide energy. But there are people that need more fats and other people that need less fats. I personally feel a little bit more balanced with a moderate fat intake. Um, but the only way that you know what you need is just by experimenting it a little with it a little bit yourself. Um, but I wouldn't say omit fats. I would say there's probably more fat in your diet than you think and you don't need to go out of your way to add fat. Hey Jess, you know I'm on that antibiotic for a few months right now. Do you think it's pointless to take a spore-based probiotic right now or worth doing it together to try to make up for anything good that might survive? Um, I think that it's probably just going to wipe that out and work kind of against each other. That would be my personal um, uh, outlook on that. However, um, there's no harm in trying. But what I usually do is after any round of antibiotics, that's when I would take a spore-based uh, spore probiotic. I would let the gut kind of settle down and not go straight from an antibiotic to a probiotic. Um, but remember that spore-based probiotics are antibiotic in nature, meaning that they implement good bugs that take care of other bugs. And so you might be getting an extra antibiotic effect from taking spore-based probiotics, and so you probably wouldn't want to do them both together, um, if that makes sense. So spore-based probiotics are antibiotic in nature, um, but they are there for you when you need to use them once you're done with your antibiotic. I sometimes get this anxious feeling like where I can't take a deep breath and it goes on all day and I have a feeling it's linked to me drinking coffee for several days in a row. It used to happen with green tea. It's like it builds in my system and messes me up. Have you ever heard of this? Is there a way I can get used to caffeine and avoid this? Some people have a um, poor breakdown of caffeine. I find that like a lot of people focus on this. They're like, oh my gosh, my genetics affect how I break down caffeine. And that is totally possible. Um, the metabolites can build up. Usually I find that this is from poor liver function and a lot of stress. So over time, you know, you your tolerance for caffeine goes up. This personally was me. I could never drink caffeine without just feeling like over time I just couldn't sleep at night. So what would happen, uh, but what I didn't realize I was doing is for years and years and years, I was drinking coffee first thing when I woke up. I was adding almond milk and stevia, ew, but also like it wasn't the best way to drink coffee. And so now I know that I have to at least get one really good big meal in me or two 
two meals actually uh, to really be able to tolerate coffee and not feel any effects from it. Um, not like a snacky meal, like if I just do some Greek yogurt and fruit in the morning, it's not enough. I still, I still will not feel good throughout the day. So I know myself personally, I've got to give myself fuel before I put my um, foot on that gas pedal, so to speak. But yes, um, that can definitely happen. The metabolites will build up over time. If you're not breaking them down properly, you're not breaking down caffeine well, whether that's just due to uh, poor liver function, not having enough nutrients, specific nutrients in your liver. Maybe, I don't know your specific situation, but do you have estrogen dominance? Um, do you have progesterone issues? Maybe thyroid issues? Those are all gonna affect how you metabolize caffeine, for sure. Um, and that is definitely a possibility. But, um, Usually over time, that should improve as you improve your metabolism, as you implement those nutrients that you need so desperately, um, as you get your blood sugar balanced, and um, usually the tolerance for caffeine will, will improve. Not sure if you already mentioned this, but could you touch on what you're going to be changing in Fully Nourished? Yeah, I will definitely. I was waiting for everyone to join to kind of talk about those updates that are going to be made. Um, oh, and another note on caffeine. Um, some people need a couple tablespoons of sugar in their coffee. And I'm not talking about coconut sugar or maple syrup. Some people just need straight up white sugar in their coffee to not be affected by it. And so that's another thing I should mention with coffee is some people just need to add sugar to their coffee. Um, and it usually takes care of the jitters and the problems. Um, and then the things that I'm going to be changing in Fully Nourished, um, it's not gonna, the, the content that you guys have learned, it's not going to really change. It might change structure a little bit. Um, I'm going to add a few more, I guess, caveats to Fully Nourished. So for example, if you're coming from a specific background, you know, maybe keto, you're insulin resistant, you're going to go through, you know, in phase one. So I'm going to actually add three different phases to Fully Nourished um, just to make it a more clear path for people that are coming from different backgrounds. For example, someone with um, maybe lots of stress, adrenal issues, they they probably will tolerate a lot more carbohydrates and need a lot more carbohydrates than something, somebody that's coming from like a low carb keto past. So I'm probably just going to add a little bit more detail. And if you're coming from this past, add in carbs at this rate. If you're coming from this path, you probably need a little bit more carbs here, yada, yada, yada. Um, and then I'm just going to restructure the modules. So I'm going to make things a little bit more clear. I'm going to add more resources. Um, the resources for each module are going to be put at the end of of each module. So for example, throughout the modules, if I or in the lessons, if I talk about specific resources or talk about specific things, you're going to have extensive amounts of resource guides at that the end of that module. So, you know, module one, if I talk about temps and pulses, there's going to be uh, all your resources for temps and pulses are going to be at the end of that module. It's going to have all of your resources listed and linked in there. So there's going to be a lot more resources added, but it's going to be uh, structured in a much more organized way so you can access the content very quickly and very easily. And I can update the content very easily. So for example, if somebody finds a new product or I find a new product, I can easily go add that to the resource list. Um, and you guys can have access to that right away. I'm constantly updating that and adding things to it. Um, but overall, there's not going to be much change in, in terms of the content. I'm mostly just going to be expanding on things. There's a lot of people that have questions on dairy, so I'm going to be expanding on that topic. There's a lot of people that have questions about counting macros, and so I'm going to be expanding on that and um, add a lesson on counting macros and how to do so and it, why you might want to. I'm going to be expanding on protein. I'm going to be adding uh, other sources of protein. I find that a lot of people are having a hard time getting protein. And then I'm just, like I said, I'm going to dive into carbohydrates a little more. I feel like some people added carbohydrates way too fast and weren't feeling very, very good. Um, so I want to maybe dive in a little deeper, clarify that you might not need as many carbohydrates so quick, don't go so fast, that kind of thing. So just expanding on the content, um, adding things that I think will be helpful. And then I'm also going to be um, posting a survey in the Facebook group. If you guys want to give your feedback and see new things in Fully Nourished, um, you'll be able to answer that truthfully and uh, anonymously. So um, I would love for your feedback. I want your feedback. I want to make Fully Nourished better for incoming students. And I want to make the content better for you as well because you have lifetime access to it. You're going to be grandfathered in. And so it's kind of one of those things where I want to make it better for you too. I want to add these resources that are going to be helpful to you. 
Do you think it's problematic to take more vitamin E than recommended dose on bottle when working on detoxing PUFA from the body? I see some people on Insta taking like four to six a day, so just curious. Personally, I think that could be dangerous. I know like, so biochemically and bio, biologically, our needs for vitamin E go up when we consume a lot of PUFAs. So I can see how that makes sense. Um, however, I don't, I don't know about taking four to six a day. That's very, that's a lot. Um, vitamin E is a fat soluble vitamin, so it can build up in the tissue. Um, I personally wouldn't. I, I tell clients to take it maybe two or three times a week if you are overweight or obese and you have a lot of fat to lose and you feel like there's going to be a lot of fat release from the fat cells. Um, maybe taking one a day could be okay. Um, I've had people who have decided to go up more and take two a day. Um, personally, when I first like got on the vitamin E train, I was taking two a day and I saw my eyesight got really bad. So that was something that I realized was due to the vitamin E. So that's just something that I, um, I figured out for myself, but there are people that take a ton and are totally fine. So I think it's just kind of a personal situation and it might take some personal experimentation. It does take a while for vitamin E to build up in the tissue. So it's not like, you know, it's going to cause problems if you've been doing that for two weeks, but long-term, I feel like that could be problematic. Um, and then, you know, men are a little bigger than women, so their needs are going to be more. So I don't know who you're looking at on Instagram, but I know there are a lot of men that might do that. Um, if you're talking about like maybe Matt Blackburn stuff, um, I think he's like always a little bit on the extreme side. It's like, oh, vitamin E is great for me. I'm going to take 20 of them, you know? And so, um, it's a good idea to just kind of be moderate with the, with the intake. But if you are overweight or obese and you're losing a lot of fat, you're opening up those fat cells, you might have higher needs for vitamin E. So with the caffeine, in your opinion, should I keep trying it until I get used to it or take a break? Drink less. I'm already only drinking about eight ounces. Well, if you're doing it after a really good, nice big breakfast, you're adding sugar to it. Um, you're adding, you know, your, your cream and your collagen and you're still experiencing problems. Totally take a break or do uh, maybe like a, a half decaf, like a half calf or something like that, or just omit altogether. There are people that just cannot tolerate caffeine at all. I literally just did a post on this on Instagram. It just told me that it posted. Um, and most people do okay with caffeine once they kind of balance out their hormones. Another thing to kind of consider is are you sodium deficient? Because some people are super sodium deficient. And remember, um, coffee has magnesium in it. It has potassium in it. It doesn't have sodium and it's a diuretic. So a lot of times it can um, have you expel some sodium. So a trick there is to add a couple pinches of sea salt to your coffee. And I know that sounds gross, like ew, salted coffee, but it actually tastes really good and it doesn't really affect the flavor of it at all. And it just kind of enhances the flavor. It doesn't make it taste salty or anything. And that's something to consider. If you're very, um, if you've been under a lot of stress, a lot of adrenal stress, a lot of women are sodium deficient. And so the addition of sea salt can kind of fix those issues because that's what's happening. The, when they're drinking caffeine, they're expelling a lot of sodium and they're not replenishing it fast enough. But yeah, I would take a break if you're feeling gross. My skin has cleared up for the first time since 2014, but I've noticed my face and scalp have been really flaky lately. Any thoughts on what might contribute to that? Hmm. Um, so that's amazing that your skin has cleared up. Obviously, there's so much, so many improvements. Um, when it comes to flaky skin and flaky hair, uh, it can be a lot of things. So it can be something as simple as like vitamin A or vitamin um, K issues. That's something that can affect the skin, um, whether it's a deficiency or getting too much. A lot of times it's a deficiency of vitamin A, but sometimes it can be getting too much. Um, another thing to kind of consider is uh, just your environment. Are, do you live in a dry, cold climate? It is winter time. It is towards the end of winter time. It's uh, a lot of people live in a dry, cold place, and so that's going to affect the skin and the scalp. Um, some stuff that we can do, especially for a flaky scalp, I personally will do like a um, scalp exfoliator once a week where I just take sea salt, like a, a really finely ground sea salt or sugar, and I'll actually scrub my scalp with that to kind of just exfoliate the scalp. Um, 
some things to try would be red light therapy as well. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure as to why that could be. I mean, there's many reasons for flaky scalp, uh, flaky skin, um, but a lot of times it just boils down to um, the climate and the weather. Some people find that simply just running a humidifier while they sleep really helps. Just having the humidity really kind of helps moisturize their skin. Um, so those are kind of the things that I would think about and experiment with. Are you taking grass-fed beef liver at all or eating grass-fed beef liver? Um, I, I think that I've seen you in the group talk about doing that. So if you, if you do do that, then you're probably getting enough vitamin A. So my guess would be more like more along the lines of climate, moisture in the air, um, possibly just being winter, that type of thing. In the Fully Nourished Supplement Guide, it talks about eating six or seven little pieces of beef liver per week. The ancestral desiccated beef liver dosage is like six pills a day. Should I take that amount or scale back? I know the two aren't exactly comparable. Yeah, you know, um, when it comes to fresh beef liver, there's a lot of vitamin A in it. And so, you know, everything that I put in Fully Nourished, I have to kind of generalize. So keep that in mind. Even though I wish I could specify and be like, take so much of this, I want to be careful because I don't know who's coming into the course. I don't know their everyone's background. And so there can be people that maybe don't understand that uh, beef liver is super rich in vitamin A. And so if I say, take a ton of it, um, they're gonna just go crazy with it and then maybe experience signs of have, getting way too much vitamin A. So I be, I'm a little bit more careful. I be careful. I am a little bit more careful with the recommendations, but you can always take those and run with it. If you want to increase your amount of beef liver, that's absolutely in your hands and you're totally allowed to do that. Most people do fine with a lot more than that. Um, I just am a little bit more careful. So when it comes to the ancestral supplements, desiccated liver, remember that desiccated liver doesn't have as much vitamin A as fresh liver. And so oftentimes you can get away with a little bit more than than um, uh, fresh liver, but six pills is fine. I personally think that's just a lot, so I'll do four, um, but six is great. Like, it, it really is. There's so many nutrients in that grass-fed beef liver. I live in Florida, so I'm not too cold here. Okay, so yeah, I haven't added liver yet because I'm still scared of it. <laughs> I don't blame you. So that would be the first thing that I would think about is vitamin A. Um, vitamin A affects the skin turnover and it affects like sebum production, skin cells, keratinization, those types of things. So it plays a lot of roles throughout the body, but it specifically plays a lot of role in skin health and this, the health of the skin cells. So I would maybe think about doing even some desiccated liver if you are good with like trying some capsules of it. Um, maybe try that and just see how that affects your skin. Um, but if you can, I know, I I know that you do do dairy so there is vitamin a in dairy as well so i don't think you're not getting any vitamin a but a lot of people who have acne or a history of skin issues usually have a history of or a, some type of slight vitamin a deficiency going on and so that is something to maybe consider it also has those great nutrients like zinc and copper B vitamins um, and are, is very supportive of the liver. So that's what I would give a try first. Whenever somebody has like a flaky scalp or flaky skin, I always go for a vitamin A rich food first. If that doesn't work, sometimes it can be gut related, totally can be um, gut issue related, especially if the flakes kind of do get to a point where they kind of get, um, become almost sores or um, become open wounds a little bit, that can definitely be uh, more of a gut related thing. So those are kind of the things that I would just keep in mind. Are there any tests you would recommend to take to get clear on whether, uh, uh, on where we are that we can order ourselves? Um, not really. I know there are a lot of like self-order tests out there. Um, the only ones that I kind of occasionally will use with clients is like uh, life extension. So they do a lot of blood testing that you can order yourself, which is really nice. But personally, I have kind of narrowed it down. I've done a lot of tests in my life. I've done a lot of tests in my career, um, everything from organic acids to mycotoxins to all those things. And I've really narrowed it down to being just the hair tissue mineral analysis, uh, GI map, and Dutch test. Those are like my three favorites. And unfortunately, those are all tests that you have to order through a practitioner. Uh, you have to be a practitioner to get an account with them. Um, there are some people online that will sell them direct to consumer. So for example, someone like me will have a place for you to order it on their website and you can just order the test and um, not 
have any consultation. I personally don't offer that yet, or I don't know if I ever will, uh, because I don't see why that would be helpful to somebody. Like, it's very difficult to interpret. It has a lot of layers. It's not something that you can just look at and be like, oh, this is what I need, great. And that's the thing with any type of test, you guys, is you have to really know what to do with a test. A test is really only worth as much as the person looking at it. And if you don't know what to do with the results that you get, or you don't know what you're looking for, oftentimes tests are, they offer no value at all. So that's why I do include how to, how to track your temps and pulses, because I think that that is the best self test that you can do to truly see what's going on inside your body and see those improvements. If you don't, um, if you don't track temps and pulses, it's very difficult to know if you're making any improvement or what the habits that you're doing are doing to your body, um, at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think like there's really not a lot of tests out there that are worth your, your money. Um, unfortunately, so say we have a day where we feel the side effects of coffee. Is there a way to combat it to help with the jitters? Oftentimes, um, it depends. Uh, if you started, a lot of times, if you start the day with coffee and you are underfed, you're going to feel the effects for the whole day because it's going to kind of send you on a, sh a blood sugar spiral. Um, oftentimes, what needs to happen is you need to eat a lot more often. You probably have to eat more protein, more carbohydrates. Like, you just have to eat more. Uh, that's the only way that I've found that clients can combat it and I can combat it is by... Um, actually increasing your, your calories a little bit and keeping blood sugar manually balanced. What I've found is I don't feel good. If I'm feeling jittery, I have to eat to get rid of those jitters. And I'll find that on a day that if I have caffeine without having enough food, I literally find myself every two or three hours uh, needing to eat something and eat something quick to get rid of those jitters. And so that shows me my blood sugar has gone on a spiral all day long. Um, some people do, it's a, it's a liver issue. So, uh, look out in my stories later after I do this live, I was going to hop on my stories and share my, my new and improved liver detox guide with you guys. So sometimes liver detox, um, or detoxification support can really, really help. Um, so if you're, you know, eating frequently, adding in like a chlorophyll lemonade, um, adding in maybe some hot chocolate or something like that with some collagen or some jello, something with gelatin in it, some bone broth can really, really help. Um, sometimes like a mineral rich drink, so like the adrenal cocktail um, or something that has some sodium and potassium, like some coconut water with some sea salt in it can help just kind of replenishing those minerals. So it just really depends on the person, but just kind of keep in your mind what caffeine is doing. It's speeding up your metabolism and and so you need to, first of all, make sure you have the fuel to back that up. So you need to make sure you're fueling yourself and then maybe replenishing the minerals that you might have lost because caffeine is a diuretic. And so um, sodium, potassium, things like that. But you mostly lose sodium when you drink caffeine. So you would maybe want to replenish the, the sea salt or salt um, the most. But yeah, usually if you're having that effect from caffeine regularly, you're probably not eating a big enough breakfast to be able to tolerate it, or you might need to get two good meals in before you drink your coffee, rather than maybe like a small snack. I've had a lot of clients, especially ones that are in fully nourished, come to me and they're doing like, um, they call it their like wake up snack. So I've had quite a few people do a wake up snack and they're eating something small so that they can drink their coffee because they love that habit. Before they came into fully nourished, they were drinking coffee on an empty stomach. So what they ended up doing was they're like, okay, I still want to drink coffee on an empty stomach or they want to drink coffee right when they wake up so they've added in this kind of wake up snack that's not quite a meal they have their breakfast later but they do some type of snack something small to get something in and some people that works really well they can do, totally do fine with like a snack and then drinking their coffee but some people are not stable enough to do that and they need a full-on breakfast um a good snack that really does tend to work well is like a piece of gluten-free toast or sourdough with some low-fat cottage cheese 
on top, like a good amount, like half a cup or a, even a full cup of cottage cheese on top with like some tomatoes or something like that. Um, and, or some fruit or something like that. And that tends to be like a really filling, satisfying, protein rich, carb balanced meal that can come before coffee. So trying some cottage cheese on toast or some cheese on toast. I found this um, creamy goat cheese at Trader Joe's. It's like, it, it's the texture of cream cheese and it almost tastes exactly like cream cheese, but it is a lot higher in protein and lower in fat than cream cheese. And it doesn't have as much gross additives. Like it's just goat cheese. Um, and that's really good on toast as well. So those are kind of some things to maybe try, but yes, you, you, you possibly have to eat a bigger meal, um, before your coffee, if you're constantly reacting it to it, uh, throughout the day. Yes, people say caffeine is a hunger suppressant, but it makes me so hungry and I already put salt in it and I eat so much. Okay. So yeah, you might not do well with coffee. You might need to take a break for a little while um, or maybe try a different type of roast. You know, some are way richer in caffeine. The lighter the roast, the higher the caffeine content. So maybe trying a dark roast coffee or something like that would help, but you might not need to force it and you might need to just give your body a break from it and revisit it in a month or two months. I know it's so good though. Um, sometimes I found, I found <laughs> my hack was because when I came off of keto, I was a wreck. I was just so wrecked mineral wise, adrenal wise. Like I was just so sensitive. Everything wrecked me. My gut was wrecked. Um, everything made me feel like I had anxiety. Like I was just so wrecked. And so I found <laughs> that instant coffee was the best option for me. For some reason, I did not react to instant coffee like I reacted to coffee that I brewed in a coffee maker. And so that was kind of my bridge to getting to where um, I could handle coffee no problem is I still did it after meals. I still followed, you know, the rules, but I um, did instant coffee instead, the Swiss water processed one, and it worked really good. I don't know what it was about the freeze dried coffee, something about it, but yeah, Coffee will make you hungry if you have it after a meal, if you have the metabolism to back it up, um, but it will be an appetite suppressant if you drink it on an empty stomach or you, you drink it kind of like a drug over drinking it as a nutrient or a supplement. But yeah, it is a bummer when you can't handle coffee, that's for sure. Um, and I was gonna, I was just thinking, sorry, this pertains to a question that was asked a while back on fats and not needing as many fats as you think you do. Um, I did want to mention though, if you're breastfeeding, you do have a higher need for fat and, uh, to, to have good milk production. And if you are pregnant, obviously, uh, you, you do need a little bit more fat as well. So those are just things to, to remember, um, the low, the lower fat works really well for weight loss or things like that, but you don't want to <laughs> be doing low fat if you're breastfeeding or being, or pregnant, obviously. Um, okay. So I got to the end of my questions. Any more questions? Um, just, you know, I'll hang around. I, um, some things that I've been seeing a lot of are, um, some questions regarding like not feeling very good. A lot of people are experiencing anxiety. Um, if you are still feeling anxious or you came into fully nourished, kind of stressed out, you you have a background of low carb or a background of keto, or maybe just unintentionally under eating carbohydrates, don't forget about your protein intake. That can be a huge, um, a huge factor. Oh yeah, I think you guys, I, I missed some questions. Sorry, I will get back to them. Um, I just wanted to mention, make sure you, you remember your protein intake as well. Um, a lot of people are under eating protein and you know they're so focused on the fat and the carbs that they forget that finding the right protein balance for you uh, is going to be very important as well. Um, I personally, and a lot of my clients find that if, if they do not get 100 grams of protein in every single day, they feel wrecked. I personally, if I don't get like a, a good hundred grams in, I do not feel good. I feel anxious. I feel jittery. I don't feel grounded. I feel kind of moody. And of course I get really bad PMS and stuff like that. Like I, I'm not detoxifying estrogen well. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind. I'm sorry, Kristen, for, for skipping your, your question. Is the FN sub, uh, oh, I don't think I did skip your question. I talked about, um, uh, you can totally do the six pills a day. Um, and I was just talking about how I kind of have to generalize everything for, uh, for 
people. So that's why I recommend a moderate amount of beef liver. I'm not recommending a lot, but you can definitely do more if you want to do more. And the ancestral supplements one is going to be fine. Um, uh, and you can do as much as you want. I personally take four because I find that six is just a lot, <laughs> but if you want to take six, that's totally great. Um, I think my question about Sheila G got lost in the shuffle. I'm sorry, Victoria. For some reason, not all of them are coming uh, up. I don't know why. Um, I'll go back and make sure I didn't miss any ones. Um, let's see. Uh, um, can you uh, can you please tell us about it? I've heard Matt Blackburn speak highly of it. She's talking about um, Sheila G. So Sheila Jeet is uh, very rich in fulvic minerals. It has every single trace mineral that you would find in nature in it. Um, it is from a very high altitude. So I believe it's from the mountains in Siberia. Um, maybe the, I don't know if it's from the Himalayas. I do know it's from Russia and it's a very nutrient rich soil. So remember when, you know, the cycle of life is death and, and, um, and death and birth, right? So when we're born, you know, we have all these nutrients and, but then eventually our bodies will, will die, they'll decompose and they'll go back into the soil to regrow into new life again, you know, uh, they will nourish the plants, they'll nourish human beings because humans are going to eat plants, humans, uh, animals are going to eat those plants, and then human beings are going to eat animals. It's a beautiful cycle of life. And so when it comes to fulvic minerals, um, when it comes to really nutrient-dense soil where things have died, plant matter, animal matter has died and broken down into the soil, and that soil has been left untouched, there's going to be uh, a lot of nutrients, powerful nutrients in that soil. And so that's really what shilajit is. It's kind of like this dirt that uh, exists in between rocks and so it's kind of like scraped off of rocks or from out of out of between rocks it's very nutrient dense it's never been really touched before and it's and it's um, in these high high altitudes so it's very very rich in I believe co2 um, and so we want to make sure that when we take it we understand that that's what we're taking that's because it tastes disgusting it tastes like dirt that's been scraped off of rocks but it is very nutrient dense it does promote a lot of energy and it helps with detoxification of iron um, it helps with detoxification of heavy metals and it really does uh help with gut health in general because a lot of times we are not no longer being exposed to these fulvic minerals you know we're not going into our garden and pulling a carrot out of the ground and just giving it a gentle rinse and then eating uh eating that including maybe some leftover minerals from the soil bacteria microbes from the soil we're no longer getting those things and so fulvic minerals can be a great addition to a diet that's devoid of you know uh foods that have been grown in a very rich soil environment so overall, it tends to be very, very powerful. I find that it's very, very gentle. Um, it, it, it's a gentle detoxifier or it's a gentle support of detoxification. It also provides the body with a lot of trace minerals. So, you know, for example, when people come to me, run an HTMA, they're low in so many minerals, you know, uh, almost all of them sometimes. And so it can be very annoying to supplement selenium and zinc and copper and every, you know, every trace mineral, manganese and uh, molybdenum. Why don't we just put in something that's going to provide trace minerals and have that extra added benefit of being detoxifying? And then, you know, after three months, retest our HTMA and see if we actually need the implementation of specific minerals. But I like Sheila Jeet. I find that it really does help um, help with libido. It helps if you have really bad detox symptoms, if you have really bad gut symptoms, it can really help with that. Um, and overall energy increase. It can be very, very just energy promoting. You can feel like you're a lot more vital. You have a lot more vitality. So that's a, a really good uh, supplement support if you can afford it, if it's something that's in your budget, if it's something that you want, kind of want to try. So that's something to kind of uh, consider. Yeah, it totally came up, Victoria. I don't know why the other question didn't come up. I'm just making sure I didn't miss anyone's question. Um, yeah, I got the macro one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm, yeah, I must have just not gotten your first question, Victoria. Weird. Okay, um, I've done the gut mapping you suggest and everything is fine, but wondering what you might suggest are top things for gut issues like gas kind of often and acne. Are you talking about, you? so you got a GI map? 
Um, how about your beta-glucuronidase? Like, is your beta-glucuronidase good? How about your IgG? Um, but if you get bloating and um, gas and acne, then I always focus on the liver first. You know, bloating and gas is going to be a general microbial microbial uh, imbalance. So a lot of times there's maybe intestinal overgrowth. Um, small intestinal overgrowth is, is a large one. You know, we have overgrowth where it doesn't belong. Remember the small intestines are pretty much supposed to be sterile. And so if you have gut issues in the sense of, you know, bloating, gas, maybe constipation, but you've done a GI map or some type of stool testing and you're fine, then you know that you most likely have bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine or you just have slow transit time and you have to really focus on improving uh, your transit time. But then the liver is also a part of the digestive tract, so don't underestimate the liver. And a lot of times if you struggle with acne, then the liver is burdened. But um, yeah, I, I would say if you've done a GI map, you know that you're good in the sense of your microbial balance is good, you don't have parasites, you don't have fungus, your uh, immune system levels are great, your beta-glucuronidase is good, everything's great and dandy on the GI map, then you want to look towards getting bacteria out of the small intestine and supporting the liver. Those are the two things that we, we, want to, we want to focus on. But some things that we can do to support the gut are going to be, you know, ginger is great for transit time. It definitely speeds it up. It's a prokinetic. Um, we can totally do things like, um, like the raw carrot salad or even bamboo shoots are a great option. Um, well, well cooked mushrooms, button mushrooms that have been boiled for at least an hour are really great. Um, remember we boil them because we want the plant toxins out of them. And so boiling them removes those. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Spore-based probiotic can be great. Um, Just Thrive, uh, the probiotic brand that I really like for the spore-based probiotic. They also have um, a supplement called IgG, which is a really good support, especially if you have like tons of food sensitivities, you react to everything. You always feel like you're exhausted and fatigued from just an overactive immune system. It can really calm the immune system down. I also like a high quality aloe vera. So um, Stockton aloe is a really great aloe vera. It comes frozen in these big gallon jugs. And if you have really bad gut inflammation or irritation or constipation, it can sometimes be a really great addition to implement for four to eight weeks to just settle the gut down. But those are kind of my favorites. And then if that doesn't help with gut issues, then maybe trying to pinpoint what could possibly be the problem. Like for example, I have a lot of people that come to me, they are pretty grain free, but they do like a lot of cassava and the cassava makes them really bloaty. Um, or they're doing lots of fruit, but they're, it's not very ripe. So figuring that situation out or doing orange juice, but it's not pulp free. And so they're reacting to the pulp, those types of things. So maybe just pinpointing if there could be something for irritating or something they're irritating. Thoughts on Irish moss for minerals. Okay. So I've been seeing this Irish moss come around. I'm just going to write it down so I don't forget to look into it. Um, I think I saw Talia like it is, um, taking it. I was, uh, I don't really know the deal, like, uh, or maybe she, that one she was taking the sea moss. I don't know. I personally have not looked into it enough, so I can't tell you. Um, I'm assuming it's maybe something similar to like spirulina, but I don't know enough about it to say anything on it. Um, I kind of stray away from, from, um, uh, like too many powders and things like that just because they tend to be, um, kind of anti-metabolic a lot of times, but I don't know enough to know, so I'm not going to say anything on it. I'm sure it is very rich in minerals. What shilajit do you take? Mine is literally like tar. It's so nasty. It's from an Ayurvedic doctor. Um, I take the pure Himalayan shilajit on Amazon. It's so inexpensive and it works really, really well. It's literally like the best one. Uh, it comes in resin tablets. I think it's like a underrated supplement because when I started recommending it to clients, they like ran out, <laughs> they like went out of stock. And so now they have a lot back in stock. They have like a little resin tablets, like the one Matt Blackburn sells, but they also have the actual resin that you have to like break apart. They were out of the tablets. So I got the one that you have to like break it into chunks and it like it's so annoying so I, I just want to like smash it with a hammer um but I'm just gonna finish it off and then I will get the resin tablets again but yeah it's called pure Himalayan shilaji it's like 12 bucks um it is nasty it tastes so nasty all of shilaji is gonna taste nasty so I just wanted to like put that out there it's gonna taste nasty regardless 
Yeah, I've gotten two SIBO tests and they were negative two. Um, that's, that's really good then. Um, you know, remember that sometimes the ileocecal valve can get open. So the bacteria is maybe just crawled a little bit into the small intestine. Remember the small intestine is 50 ish feet long. So it's very long. Um, so sometimes you're going to have methane or hydrogen, hydrogen producing bacteria, but when you breathe it up, um, it might not always show up positive. Um, so it can just maybe possibly be a transit time issue, or maybe you're reacting to things. Maybe you're not making enough digestive enzymes. Remember digestive enzymes and hydrochloric acid are very important. Um, also bile, uh, are you, you know, are your, um, bowel movements looking normal or are they maybe floaty? Um, are they kind of sporadic? Those are things to kind of think of as well. You know, it could be a bile. Uh, I, I'm always looking at like hydrochloric acid, digestive enzymes slash pancreatic function, and then also like uh, bile uh, flow and bile function because all those three things are going to be affected when your metabolism is slow and suppressed. Your gallbladder is not going to secrete bile properly. Your pancreas is definitely not going to be able to produce as many enzymes as it should. And your stomach acid is going to be low. So those are things to also consider when it comes to gut health. Sometimes just overall digestive capacity is really low and actually increasing those things can be helpful. Sometimes simply just taking a digestive enzyme can be really helpful while you're in, in your healing process, just to lower the amount of discomfort. Hi Jess, hope you're well. I hope you're well too, Sandy. Can the craving for sugar be a stress response during the cycle? I balance meals with sugar regularly, but notice this cycle I'm getting that extra craving for it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I personally get an increased need for sugar. I, I say need because when I say craving, it's like, oh my gosh, you have sugar cravings? Like, oh my gosh. And I'm just like, my body just needs extra carbs. Um, and if I'm not being really good about making sure I'm getting, you know, making sure I'm getting plenty of potato and making sure I'm getting plenty of um, sweet potato or parsnips. I love parsnips, by the way, like underrated carb, delish. Um, and sometimes I actually need to add the addition of grain. So like rice or, um, maybe even like a little quinoa, something like that can, can help kind of like satisfy me. Um, but yeah, I definitely find that my need for sugar goes up as well as a lot of my clients. They tend to, you do tend to get more imbalanced blood sugar when you start your period, but even during the luteal phase. And so needs for protein go up with progesterone production as do carbohydrate needs. But actually protein tends to be more of a need when it comes to progesterone because pro progesterone can actually help with the catabolization of protein. So if you're taking progesterone or you are, um, you know, you're making progesterone, progesterone, obviously sometimes we're doing both of those things, then we do have an increased need for protein just a little bit, especially for strength training. So those are the kind of things to keep, uh, keep in mind. Make sure you're getting enough protein. Make sure you're getting enough carbs. Um, sometimes we do need to increase our carbohydrates. Sometimes we need to increase our protein and sometimes we need to increase both. So um, yeah, you, you, you can definitely see a need for sugar. My favorite thing to do is when I am um, about to start my period is I drink uh, some Mexican Cokes. I drink like a Mexican Coke every single day, um, <laughs> like three days before my period starts and usually like maybe once or twice while I'm on my period. I don't know, something about the mixture of the caffeine, the sugar, um, the carbonation, the gut settling, like Coca-Cola can be pretty gut settling and kind of help um, keep things moving as well. So for some reason for me, like a Mexican Coke is like my cure all when I'm about to start my period. And then adding a little salt to it is just cherry on top. Um, but the, the ginger ale that I show in my PMS SOS highlight story on Instagram is also a really good option. Um, to get a little bit of extra sugar in. And remember, drink those with a meal, don't drink them alone. Like not a great idea to drink Coke alone, but if you're eating it with a juicy steak, probably fine. Uh, so those are kind of the, the things that I really like to do because um, your needs for sugar and uh, salt greatly increase, um, usually around, around three or four days before you start your period. Um, and some people cannot handle a Coke yet. Um, some people that are really metabolically unstable or, you know, they haven't done balanced meals for a while. I don't recommend just going out and like drinking a Coke, but you can have, you know, a Coke here and there as a part of a healthy diet, as long as it's cane sugar sweetened and not 
high fructose corn syrup sweetened. Um, that's a recipe for an iron disaster. Sorry, my nose is so itchy. I have to itch it. I was like, I'm going to try to save that. <laughs> but I'm like, I have to. My nose is so itchy. Um, yeah, but we still have more questions uh, if you guys want. Um, like I said, I will be kind of uh, the, the most of the things that are going to change and fully nourished are going to be just the addition of counting macros. I don't think that's necessary. And I, I really didn't want to stray too far from fully nourished being what it is, which is, you know, proper nourishment, balancing your meals and focusing on those things. I really don't want people to feel obsessed about their food. I want people to feel exactly the opposite. However, I do think it's important to be empowered by your food. And sometimes if we're coming from, you know, we're such, we have such a confused background or we've tried all these different diets, we have no idea which way's up, which way's north, which way's south. We kind of need some type of direction. Macros can be sometimes very helpful to just kind of have some type of guideline as to, okay, I now understand how much fat I'm eating. I now understand how many carbs I'm eating. I now understand that I'm getting enough protein, that kind of thing. So uh, I am going to add th that in as an option for people, but I'm going to make it clear that you don't need to count macros to have success. It can just be an extra added step if you need it. All right, you guys, um, I'm going to do a last call for questions just to make sure I get to, I got to everyone's question. There's no questions kind of like in the back of your mind and, um, keep in mind that this is going to be an every first Monday of every month is going to be the fully nourished Q and a. So I don't know what time yet. Um, like I said, I might try to change up the time for the people that are out of the United States on the other side of the planet. They need <laughs> me to do it in the morning. So I might do that occasionally. But um, I want to make sure that everyone has access to me and can answer questions or get, ask their questions and get them answered. Do you have any tips for listening to your body and connecting symptoms to food you ate? I have a headache today and I'm frustrated because I feel like I don't know why or how to trail back to maybe what caused it. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's very important to kind of take a step back and just... Um, first of all, just do kind of like a self-check. I always say, like, um, am I safe? Am I fed? Am I heard? And am I loved? So sometimes our symptoms can be mental and emotional. You know, are we um, maybe in a fight with somebody? Are we maybe, you know, irritated or have someone irritated at us? Um, maybe do we have something that we want to communicate to somebody that we can't for whatever reason or we haven't yet. So those are something that we have to kind of, you know, make sure that's not a factor because a lot of times it is and we're just not in tune with that at all. Um, a lot of times, you know, I might have to set boundaries with a client or, you know, do something that is really affecting me mentally or emotionally. And, t and until I do that thing, it's affecting me minute by minute. Um, the second thing is, you know, did you eat something that you don't normally eat? Or did you maybe eat in a way that you don't normally eat? For example, you know, I usually eat breakfast within 30 minutes of waking. But if I didn't eat breakfast within 30 minutes of, of waking and I'm having a symptom later on, I now know, okay, I didn't follow my normal habits and it's most likely because I didn't eat uh, within an hour of waking or whatever, within 30 minutes of waking. So those are kind of things that you want to make sure, like, do I need a snack? Do I need a nap? You know, um, do I need a hug? Those are kind of like my three. Um, are you tired? Did you get good sleep the night before? What phase of your cycle are you in? Are you a week before your period? A lot of times headaches are going to be estrogen related then. So kind of like keeping in mind, you know, what phase of your cycle that you're in. Did you do anything different regarding food? Are you extra stressed? Did you sleep on your neck wrong? Um, are you, you know, emotionally or mentally distraught? Like those are all things to kind of think of. Did you get your carrot in? Big thing for me is when I'm feeling off, I sometimes find like, oh my gosh, I've missed my carrot for two consecutive days and I feel it today. So those are kind of some things. But yeah, I think it's just kind of doing like a mental inventory of things that could be uh, driving that. Um, oftentimes, if I find it is something that I ate, a dose of activated charcoal usually takes care of it. So that's how I know, like if I have a headache, I'll take activated charcoal. And if that wipes it out, then I know it's something that I ate. Sometimes I just don't stress about it. I'm like, it's something that I ate. Maybe I didn't tolerate it well, whatever. Move on. Um, if you can't pinpoint it. If you, if you clearly ate something that's out of your normal routine, then of course you're like, okay, I know exactly what it was. Um, but usually I'll just do some activated charcoal. And if it's something that I ate, I usually uh, know exact, 
know that it is something that I ate because the activated charcoal wiped it out. All right, I will do this last question. Trisha says, teeth seem more sensitive since eating more fruits and sugar. Any tips? I'm crazy about dental hygiene and flossing and such. Um, just make sure you rinse your mouth out with water after you eat. Um, that's, you know, simple. If you have gut issues or any type of digestive issues, eating uh, carbs can sometimes uh, exacerbate like an, uh, enamel issues or... Um, you know, you can get some tooth issues. So just make sure you're simply rinsing after your meals. You're not letting orange juice sit on your teeth for three hours or four hours. You're not letting, you know, fruit sit on your on your teeth for three or four hours. But a lot of times the, the starch is actually the issue. So if you've increased your amount of starches you're eating, oftentimes those are actually going to cause more teeth problems than uh, the fruits. Um, but just make sure you're rinsing your mouth after you eat. And usually that takes care of it. Um, if it, that continues keep fat soluble vitamins in mind. Things like vitamin K2, um, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin D, those are all going to be nutrients that affect our teeth. All right, you guys, um, I'm sorry for keeping you so long. It's been an hour. Um, this will be saved in, in uh, the, the group. So if you want to go back and rewatch, you totally can. I will be going live on Wednesday um, as well on my Instagram like I normally do. But uh, yeah, uh, keep... Uh, I'll keep you posted with the, the fully nourished updates that are coming soon. Keep an eye out for the, the survey that's going to be going out. So you guys can totally give me your feedback. If you want something added to fully nourish, you want some improvements, you think uh, you have some good ideas regarding like, oh, I would have loved to see this in fully nourish or this really confused me or I would really like you to expand on that. I want to give you guys the opportunity to give me that feedback. So please give me that feedback. It's a quick survey. I don't want you to take too much time out of your day. I mean, right now all we got is time, right? But <laughs> I'm hoping that that changes soon. So um, keep an eye out for that. I'll be sending it to your emails as well as putting in in the Facebook group and I'll let you guys know once Fully Nourished has been updated what's different what's changed that kind of thing but um, I hope to hear from you guys soon and yeah I'll see you at the next live love you guys